and thanks to all of you for being with us today. Um, really pleased to be starting up this series again, the, the subject specialist talks that uh, began as a, uh, a benefit to our uh, education staff here at Olana, and it's a wonderful benefit of this virtual medium with which we've all become comfortable by now that we can share with a wider audience. Um, so these talks are intended to take a deep dive into some aspect of the Olana story, um, and we'll be doing just that today with a, a wonderful speaker who's been thinking for a long time about the topic he's sharing with us. I have the, uh, the thoughtful catalog here of the exhibition in question, um, Virginia Arcadia, the Natural Bridge in American Art, um, to which Olana is a lender. And I was pleased to see all of Olana's loans there on one page, these preparatory drawings by Frederick Church for one of his uh, iconic canvases that we'll hear about a little later. Um, so for those of us who love Olana and Frederick Church, this is a, a part of his legacy that you, you may not know as well as the other natural wonder he painted, Niagara Falls. Um, but this Virginia story is a really rich one in which Church enters into an uh, ongoing dialogue, both before and after his time, responding to this one iconic subject. Um, so uh, Dr. Oliver has offered us a really unique perspective on, on, on that with this rich exhibition that is currently on view at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, where he is assistant curator of American art. Um, it is open, uh, admittedly challenging times, but we hope that many of you will get there to see it. I am certainly hoping to get down to see it for myself before it closes August 1st, if memory serves. Um, Dr. Oliver has been at the VMFA since 2013. Um, he has particular interests in American painting, sculpture, and, and prints of the 18th and 19th century. Um, he has published widely on these topics and uh, contributed to a number of exhibitions, including curating The Likeness of Labor in 2015 and co-curating Remnants and Rivals, Architectural Etchings by Charles Marion and John Taylor Arms in 2016. Um, many other great projects at that, that um, really interesting and exciting institution, the VMFA, that is making major headline grabbing acquisitions like uh, Asher B. Durand's Progress recently, a really big deal for the field, um, and also exciting um, outdoor projects like uh, the Kid de Wiley uh, Rumors of War out, out front, which we New Yorkers saw in Times Square not so long ago. Um, so exciting things happening down there. He'll be able to give us a perspective on, on these good projects, hopefully a teaser for a trip down to Richmond before the show closes. Um, so we'll have a good conversation at the end. Uh, without further ado, could you join us, Chris, and we'll turn off my camera. Thank you. There we are. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Margo. Thank you as well. Uh, let me just go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint very quickly. There we go. I hope you all can see it. Uh, thank you to Olana and everyone for, for inviting me to join you today. I don't need to tell you how special a place Olana is. Um, I've enjoyed every trip I've ever made it made there, uh, including my very first one as a graduate student when I came just to do some research uh, and, and look at some special collections and things related to my graduate work. Uh, and the spirit I got there was just overwhelmingly welcoming. Uh, and that's always really stuck with me. So I'm really pleased to be able to join any sort of educational programming uh, that Olana is offering to, uh, today. So our talk today, or our, our hour that we'll spend together today, concerns one single painting. Um, that is this kind of really remarkable painting that I, I know is probably already familiar to so many people in this audience. That is Church's Natural Bridge, Virginia from 1852, currently in the collection of the Fraylin Museum of Art at the University of Virginia. Uh, this is a painting I've been thinking about for, for several year, years. I, will, uh, I did my graduate work at the University of Virginia and was always keeping uh, an interest in this painting. And it's been really satisfying to especially highlight it in an exhibition that Will mentioned that has opened at BMFA, Virginia Arcadia, the Natural Bridge in American Art. Um, we made this show a little bit longer than a show this size would normally run, so it does go to August 1st. I'd love to welcome any and all of you uh, to Richmond to see it, uh, and it's, it's a really exciting opportunity for us to highlight this iconic site uh, within the Commonwealth of Virginia that is visited by so many American and international artists. Here's just a, a, a simple installation shot um, to give you a sense of what we're dealing with. And except for the two drawings from Olana that you see it left and the, uh, the painting by Church itself, we'll kind of not be dealing with anything you, you see past it. In fact, uh, I really wanna spend most of the day with Frederick Church and building up um, what Church's art historical knowledge of this site was prior to his first visit in June of 1851. So 
shifting our sight a little bit here, now you can see the painting in the gallery with the three drawings Olana has lent. Um, the one that is a little indented to the left is the one that is directly related to the final painting that he worked up in his New York City studio and finished in the win early winter of 1852. So we'll return to um, Olana's drawings and the Fralin Museum's painting, but uh, I think we necessarily need to start with the basics. Uh, what is the Natural Bridge of Virginia? I'm not a native Virginian. Uh, I did not know about the Natural Bridge of Virginia uh, apart from through the art that depicted it. Um, so the Natural Bridge of Virginia, I've indicated it with a, this red star roughly on this map at the right. It's a 215 foot tall limestone geological formation in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia that was formed hundreds of millions of years ago. So many of the artists and scientists of this era that we'll be talking about today didn't really know how it was formed but the large consensus now, and the one that's presented by the state park, is that it's the last remnant of an underground cavern, the last part of the roof that has not collapsed uh, into the Cedar Creek, which runs below it. Um, Natural Bridge has uh, importance geologically, but also as a site of American history and American myth making. And I want to start with American myth first, and then we'll turn to American fact, which is not often that separated from myth. Uh, this early 20th century postcard gives you the sense of two important figures associated with the bridge, but we will go ahead and dismiss George Washington as having a tremendously important legacy on the site. He did not survey the natural bridge. He did not carve his initials some 25 feet up um, along the base of the Cedar Creek. Um, but the natural bridge did have a very early and important association with Thomas Jefferson. And so as we look at the, oh, 80 some year history of the Natural Bridge of Virginia prior to Frederick Turbidge's visit, no single figure really is more important than Thomas Jefferson. He purchased the land in 1774 from the English crown and he owned it for the remainder of his life. He quotes uh, f very famously saying once he only considered himself a guardian for the most curious uh, of the most, excuse me, of a natural curiosity. The quote just went right, right out of my mind. So Jefferson, and I'll return to the significance of this painting a little bit later, but Jefferson is, is intimately tied to the natural bridge, uh, having owned it and having become an important um, proponent of the bridge, really crafting what the late 18th, early 19th century um, public understanding of the natural bridge is and was. So I mentioned that he purchased it in 1774, but he likely learned of the Natural Bridge from his father, Peter Jefferson. Peter um, was a surveyor. He was the chief surveyor of Goochland County, and in the early 1750s was hired by, um, by the royal authorities to sur survey all of Virginia and look where industry, commerce, and settlements were, were most uh, densely grouped which as you might assume was along the Eastern portions of Virginia. In the Western portions of Virginia, uh, where, we, where the Natural Bridge is located, Jefferson and his partner, Joshua Fry, likely never actually surveyed. In fact, we know that most of basically the left-hand side of the map, as you're looking at it, is based on oral and written reports that Jefferson and Fry were told. So that's why at the spot of the Natural Bridge, we see not the Natural Bridge, but rather just the name John Peter Sally. And Sally is a name that's largely lost to history, but I think is important for our talk today. Sally was a German immigrant who lived at the site of the Natural Bridge or very close by. In the early 1740s, he was hired by the Virginia colonial government to explore its claims as far west as the Mississippi River to, to make sure there's no French encroachment on this vast swath of Virginia's territory. Sally and a band of men set out um, from the Natural Bridge. Uh, they say a Christian mass before departing. And then they go on a several year odyssey traveling down the Ohio River to the Mississippi where they're captured by the French and imprisoned in New Orleans for a few years. Sally eventually via a trade with the English makes it to Charleston, South Carolina and back to his home in Virginia. But this whole story, this, this odyssey in colonial America is written down by either Fry or Jefferson and sent back with the original design of this map to London to be engraved. And it's tremendously interesting to me that this early association 
of Western explorer exploration, uh, especially for the Jefferson family, uh, starts off with the Natural Bridge. The Natural Bridge is the literal jumping off point for this important Western uh, journey. So we see the first images of the Natural Bridge appear in 1786. Uh, this is actually 1787 sec second edition. The first edition was in French because it appeared in Paris. Uh, it appeared in the travel log of um, a French military officer who served at the Battle of Yorktown. And after um, the, the English's defeat, he spent some time in Virginia traveling. And after visiting with Jefferson at Monticello, he was encouraged to travel to the Natural Bridge where he was so overwhelmed with it that he had his military engineer produce these three images that you see here. Uh, the top two images very much sit in a kind of uh, continental uh, landscape tradition, whereas I think the bottom image is so wholly of the military engineer uh, tradition that only bird's eye view of this era that, that I certainly know of. But it's important to note that in 1786, when this image appears in Paris, Jefferson is also now in Paris. So he's now the minister to France and he's formulating, disseminating, and then finally in 1787 publishing notes on the state of Virginia, this tremendously important publication describing the climate, geology, society, politics of this newly formed state of Virginia. Now he's of course very eager, I would assume, uh, but at least successful in promoting his own property at the Natural Bridge, uh, penning one of the more uh, long lasting descriptions of the bridge, that the Natural Bridge, the most sublime of nature's works, so beautiful an arch, so elevated, so light, and springing as it were up to heaven. The rapture of the spectator is really indescribable. So Jefferson now in Paris is beginning to craft the idea of an important national icon at the Natural Bridge. And he does so through several manners. Uh, he's writing to artists, including his travel companions, uh, John Trumbull and Mariah Cosway to come to Virginia and to paint it. Uh, but he's also positioning uh, the Natural Bridge as is a um, national icon that is of the level of something like Niagara Falls. So when in this very well-known letter from Jefferson to Mariah Cosway, she's departing Paris and he's debating between his head and his heart, his intellectual or his rational and irrational sides, how he could convince her to come to America, he writes of Cosway, she only wants subjects worthy of immortality to render her pencil immortal. The falling spring, the cascade of Niagara, the passage of the Potomac through the Blue Mountains, which we more commonly now know as Harper's Ferry, and the Natural Bridge. It is worth a voyage across the Atlantic to see these objects, much more to paint and make them, and thereby ourselves known to all ages. And so this is interesting. So Jefferson is positioning Niagara and then two Virginia landscapes. Uh, Harper's Ferry and the Natural Bridge as these balanced sites worthy of immortality of the uh, interest of an international artist such as Causeway. And so we're, we're going through this part of the story pretty quickly because I want to get to church. But what I find interesting is that this plays out in a lot of different theaters, including how Jefferson has designed uh, Monticello. And we know Jefferson's architectural design of, of his home is incredibly important, but also where and where he places his art and, and how it signifies the man and his role in the new nation. And so in the dining room, the kind of most formal of these entertaining um, areas, we see on one side of the only window in this room, this large pedimented window, two Virginia landscapes by William Roberts, um, the Natural Bridge and Harper's Ferry, paired on the other side with two engravings of Niagara Falls after John Vanderlyn's paintings. Again, creating this rhetorical twinning balancing. And so in the exhibition it, uh, itself, we've recreated this idea by thinking of Jefferson as doing, uh, doing precisely this at Monticello. And I also have to point out, because it's one of the things that intrigued me most very late in this project. It's also thinking about Jefferson himself as patron of the arts, the Virginia landscape uh, painter William Roberts, whose two works are at left. Well, Jefferson was his main supporter and, and, and painter or patron. Uh, but for John Vanderlyn, the prince after whose paintings are at right, his major patron was Aaron Burr. And by the time these works were installed at Monticello, Burr 
uh, Jefferson's former vice president is now his kind of enemy. And, and Jefferson is establishing himself as an equal in um, the artistic patronage of the new nation. So one of the real remarkable finds of this exhibition, well, it's not a find, it was already known, but remarkable inclusions in this exhibition is this eight foot tall portrait of Thomas Jefferson at the Natural Bridge. It's remarkable because it's not only the first painting of the Natural Bridge, but the only lifetime image of Jefferson at the Natural Bridge. And even more so fascinating is that it makes its debut in New York City in March of 1801, only weeks after Jefferson has been inaugurated as president. In fact, we only know this artist's name, Caleb Boyle, who for any other reason, it, it would have been unknown because he takes an advertisement out in a New York City paper saying that this work is appearing with a portrait of, by John, of John Jay by Boyle uh, at New York City's Shakespeare Gallery. In fact, it's interesting to consider this work uh, with that pendant portrait of Jay. So Jefferson is the new president. He's the first Democratic Republican president. He's the first president who has gone through a transfer of power between parties. And Jay is a much beloved but now retired Federalist. And the visual language and iconography of the two works, the work at right also by Caleb Boyle, um, could not be more different, right? So Jay's portrait is picking up so much of that Federalist language that we see in works like the Lansdowne portrait, the kind of um, ornate trappings of government completely on display with uh, Rococo furniture, drapery, monumental columns. Jefferson himself, I mean, is presented totally different. Now, I don't think Jefferson influenced the creation of this portrait outside of the fact that he was promoting a very public image of himself as a simple man, an erudite man uh, who can appreciate the complex pictorial and picturesque um, aspects of the wilderness and the landscape, but a simple man in Virginia's you know, hinterlands, not those in the powers of New York and Washington, Philadelphia. Um, so as I said, Boyle would not have sat, had Jefferson sat, sit for him. Uh, Jefferson's head comes from an engraving after a Rembrandt Peel painting. And here he's lifting the depiction of the natural bridge from a 1799 engraving by the Irish artist, Isaac Weld. But here again, on a very public stage in 1801, we see the president, Thomas Jefferson, tied with the natural bridge. And that that, that tie is something that will continue through uh, the history of the natural bridge in American art. And perhaps the first um, artist to most really engage with that was the English born, but Philadelphia based uh, painter and engraver, Joshua Shaw. He traveled through the American South in 1819 and 1820, visiting the natural bridge in 1820. Um, Jack Thomas Jefferson was still alive at this time period. Uh, and he, he would have been thinking of Jefferson as he's touring the grounds. We know that because in this unusual view, the only view from the top looking down, you can see in the center of this figure on his hands and knees looking over the edge of the natural bridge. And that's precisely how Thomas Jefferson had described his own experience there in notes on the state of Virginia saying, you involuntarily fall on your hands, creep to the parapet and peep over it. So, you know, Shaw is being very explicit with his knowledge of Jefferson here and his uh, literary tie here to this site. Well, Jefferson dies in 1826, really before his, uh, before he can see the first great wave of American artists visiting the Natural Bridge and taking it up as a, a central subject in American landscape painting. I point out these two great works by Jacob Caleb Ward because Ward is one of the first artists that I know of who um, begin a practice of the, these two views of the Natural Bridge. One that is first taken from the base of the Cedar Creek at left where you are down below the arch looking upwards. And then a second, where you back up to this precipice about a third of a mile away from the arch itself. Um, and this is how the path from the roadway up top would have, would have lent you to this site. But it becomes a practice that we see in other artists and that is specifically written down by an artist named David Hunter, Hunter Strother. 
So we see it first in Ward's work, that Frederick Church does it, and after Church, David Johnson does it, creating a series of, of wonderful paintings. But so let's start to turn our heads more specifically towards Frederick Church and his painting. Um, in 1825, there is this amazing wash uh, on paper piece created by Daniel Wadsworth. Daniel Wadsworth is probably most remembered uh, in this crowd as being a great patron of Thomas Cole and of church and the person who connected the two. But let's not forget that Wadsworth was himself very much an, uh, an amateur but active artist. Um, and before many of these artists, he, he's depicted the Natural Bridge probably on a visit he made with his brother-in-law, uh, a Yale science professor uh, in 1825. Um, so this would have been among the kind of cache of images that Wadsworth had at his home near Hartford when the following year he meets with Thomas Cole. Um, you know, Wadsworth is encouraging the young, youngest Cole to, to take up the American landscape and look at different sites. And we know that Cole never does. He never does paint the nat visit or depict the natural bridge. But I'm really struck in several of his works, uh, the appearance of certain bridge naturally formed rock bridge imagery. Uh, the, the, you know, 1827, the year after he meets Wadsworth, this bridge of fear, which relates to his um, ex Adam and Eve expulsion from the Garden of Eden. Um, but the natural bridge as, as playing a part of that sublime sense that you get from looking over it or crossing it as Jefferson had written. And then of course, this work from the Wadsworth Athenaeum Evening in Arcady, which again, I do not believe is a direct reference to the natural bridge, but I'm so struck by how the right part of each of these bridges seems to have a very uh, similar outline, similar formation in the pool of water at the front. Uh, and the Goodacre uh, image at left, which first appeared around 1832 is one of the most widely distributed images of the natural bridge um, in this point in the 19th century and will reappear in some of the artworks that we'll look at a little bit later. So how does Frederick Church find himself at the Natural Bridge? We know much of, I'm sure many of us know much of his story up to this point in 1851. Uh, of course, born to a prominent Hartford family, connected to Cole where he trained under him, uh, devastated by Cole's premature death. Um, and and as, as Church is a young artist, still looking to establish himself in um, the New York City art world where he has his studio. Uh, he befriends and makes a great patron in the young, uh, now wealthy and retired businessman, Cyrus Field. Um, Field, of course, we're, we can already think and jump to their great South American adventures. Uh, in 1853, but we'll concentrate today on what happens between their kind of first um, run-ins in the late 1840s and their trip through Virginia in 1851. So before coming to Virginia, Frederick Church exhibited this amazing painting, West Rock, New Haven, 1849. Uh, it is largely acknowledged among American art scholars to be the work that put him on the map, made him an academician, and um, kind of made him put to be taken very seriously as American landscape painter in the wake of Cole's death. And of course, this painting was immediately purchased by Cyrus Field. Uh, and, and, and I have to acknowledge so many other scholars before me, Frank Kelly and others who, who have well discussed this painting uh, and, and could do more, more so today in, in a better way, but, but briefly, um, what this is, is, is a painting that shows contemporary landscape imbued with themes of American history. So that push and pull be between timeless and iconic and momentary and contemporary, something I'm very interested in uh, and, and reappears throughout this exhibition, in fact. But here we see a landscape outside of New Haven, Connecticut, uh, showing a rock formation at distance while in the distance, a church steeple uh, and some farmers working in the fields in the foreground. Um, but what was well known and understood at the time is that this was also a nod to Connecticut's own history and its harboring of English judges, two English judges who had sentenced Charles I to execution um, at the beginning of the American Civil, American English Civil War, and then um, 
during the restoration of Charles II were forced to flee England because, of course, Charles II um, issued uh, ex execution orders for those judges. And two of those judges hid in West Rock, New Haven, uh, harbored by, by Cromwell sympathizing Puritan uh, settlers uh, of Connecticut. Um, for many people of this era, this was a kind of presage to the American Revolution itself and the idea uh, that opposition to tyranny is fidelity to God, as it was written much later in the 19th century. So this kind of layering of contemporary landscape with deep American history themes is something that I think Field, having now owned this painting and Church, having been uh, very lauded for this painting, must have had with them as they're thinking about the natural bridge of Virginia and their trip in 1851. So they're Destination was a big Southern trip. They started in Virginia, but they went through what is now West Virginia down the Ohio and briefly on the Mississippi River. Oh, in Kentucky as well, excuse me. But it all started at Mount Vernon, a very interesting site for them to be, to start with, but um, not totally surprising in my consideration of this project. Uh, in fact, their arrival at Mount Vernon was very early on in what we can call the first season of tourism at Mount Vernon. Uh, the owner of Mount Vernon at this time, John Augustine Washington III, uh, had started to allow for kind of tourist industry at the site for the first time. Um, the site, as you can see from this photograph much a few years later, it was incredibly dilapidated. Here are the piazza roof being held up by ship masts. Um, and so church and field arrive uh, in June of 1851, and I don't, I checked this earlier. I'm sorry this is peered with these lines on it. It didn't when I tried this earlier today. But this is um, Frederick Church's sketch of Washington's tomb at Mount Vernon, something I find very interesting for the landscape painter. Uh, taking interest here, perhaps it feels direction we don't know, but uh, at something that is very architectural, very specific, and of course, incredibly tied to American history. And I apologize that it's hard to make out, but. Uh, on the uh, pediment uh, above the, the Gothic arch, it says here lies the, the body of George Washington. And then directly down where the gate opens, you see the sarcophagus containing uh, George Washington. Martha's to the left is completely obscured. So here placing the figure of Washington, father of our country and so forth, uh, at the center of this architectural composition. Uh, something I think that combines again, a historic site with a historic person, which I think we consider as we go on our trip through Virginia. Before reaching the Natural Bridge, Church stays uh, at Shirley Plantation. This is an existing plantation in Charles City County, just east of Richmond. Uh, he had such a nice stay that he penned this or drew this little uh, drawing and gave it to the owner. Uh, the plantation, like the drawing, uh, is still in the family today. Um, but now this was Church's second stop at a plantation, a working plantation, Mount Vernon and Shirley, both being working plantations. And also I'll kind of return to in a little bit, um, I started to, in, in the creation and research of this project, I started to wonder about Church, his feelings on slavery in 1851, and his comfort around this as he now traveled from Shirley up the James River, all the way to the Natural Bridge, oh, not to the Natural Bridge, but to close by where he could then go by land to the natural bridge, all the while, all the time, of course, passing through working plantation after working plantation. So it's in June of 1851 that he reaches the natural bridge, producing these three extraordinary drawings on site. These are the three works in Olana's collection that are on view here in our galleries in Richmond. Um, they show church working at the site, as I mentioned, Ward had at left. He has come down the path from the top of the bridge and paint, or sketches it from below. And from here in the middle, he's gone a third of a mile away as he writes at the bottom of the sketch. And that right, I know it's hard to decipher. It's very light, even in person. But this is his view from the top of the bridge, looking down into the valley. Don't know if it's not as explicit to me whether he would have read notes on the state of Virginia and been aware of that. Uh, but certainly these three views being that kind of circulation around the site and thinking of a, a practice that, that wasn't really codified, but seems to have been regularly done by each of the artists that visits. So how does a drawing like this get worked up into a finished painting like this? Well, Church, as I'm sure 
for you who've heard many times before, is nothing but meticulous and specific. So much so that when Field and Church were at this site, Cyrus Field famously pocketed some of the rocks from beneath the arch and offered them to Church saying, why don't you take these back to New York? So that when the painting is created, the colors will match specifically. Church declined, but of course Field kept the rocks and when the painting was delivered, those colors did perfectly match. And the way Church was able to um, achieve that is through something not, I mean, his own little paint by numbers scheme in a way. So we see uh, at the top right, the top of the arch, um, this section here, where he's written all of these various numbers, which then correspond to the key at bottom. So seven is whitish, uh, eight is more brown than four, which is dark, cold, gray, and blackish. Um, giving him all these references for what the colors should be. And he also writes throughout the um, oh, black walnut, noting uh, at, at right, you know, the specific type of vegetation as well. So, you know, in Church's final paintings, as well as his working method, there's an extreme amount of precision. At the bottom, he's included a single figure. The only sense of human presence, well, not the only sense of human presence, but the only figure is this man in a black coat and white pants maybe holding like a fishing rod, I'm not quite sure. But what is sure is that this figure down here among the weeds, as it were, does not appear in the final painting. Rather, what does appear is this unusual duo at the foreground positioned right near Frederick Church's signature and the date of 1852, a seated white woman with a standing African-American man with his hand raised, presumably pointing towards the arch of the natural bridge and talking about its history. Uh, it has been pointed out by other scholars, uh, including Eleanor Harvey, that this is likely a reference to a man named Patrick Henry, who was, uh, would have been known to church and other visitors to the bridge. Uh, who was Patrick Henry? Patrick Henry was a, an African-American man born enslaved in Westmoreland County, Virginia. He worked and purchased his own freedom and then moved far westward to Lexington, Virginia, where he fell in love with a woman named Louisa, purchased her out of freedom, out of slavery, and then was hired by Thomas Jefferson, hired by Thomas Jefferson in 1817 to be the caretaker of the land. Uh, Jefferson had a, a little structure built for him. Uh, he would keep off people who were trying to run off with his lumber and other natural good things in the environment. Uh, but he was also instructed to be a tour guide. And we know from some of Jefferson's own family who visit the site that he would beat paths through the, through the brush for people to work their way down to the base of the bridge to um, lay logs across the Cedar Creek for, the, for them to, um, to go across and keep dry. Uh, so Henry was well known as this caretaker slash tour guide. So this is a figure that Church would have understandably wanted to include. Henry was dead by this point. He died in 1831, 20 years prior to Church's visit. But what's interesting to me is that no contemporary source, no contemporary source that I've seen, note that Henry was a free man of color. They all say that he was enslaved by Jefferson, sometimes brought from Monticello and held enslavement at the Natural Bridge. And I think that's the story Church was told. And I think we can then begin to understand this painting through Church, including an enslaved man uh, standing at the uh, literal foreground of the painting, uh, speaking to this woman. So some of the other things I began to notice is that noticing that the, the upraised arm and finger of this, of this man, yes, they go towards the archway here, but they go through the only other point directly to the only sign of human presence in this landscape, that is this split rail fence missing one of its rail, which to me indicate the presence of an active roadway. There's been a road running across the natural bridge since before European contact. There was in 1851, and US Route 11 runs across the natural bridge today. It's always been an important thoroughfare. Um, in fact, that specific site on the bridge has appeared in other works of art. Uh, this much earlier but widely circulated image of the Natural Bridge, uh, which was actually in a magazine called the Analectic Magazine, shows the Natural Bridge as a roadway with this wagon crossing the bridge. 
And so when I was looking at images of Olana sketches, I was fascinated to see on the reverse of this sketch of the natural bridge, Church's own sketch of a little Conestoga wagon. He doesn't put it in the actual composition itself or the final painting, but it's something he would have seen through the just business and industry that surrounded the natural bridge and the people plying that road uh, in Conestoga wagons. So that same year, and he returns to New York, and there's again another appearance of a similar wagon. In fact, later on his trip, before returning to New York, he sketches another little Conestoga wagon uh, in Kentucky. The Conestoga wagon, you know, I, to be quite frank with you, previously would have thought in my mind was something that we, that Amer in American history was used for crossing the Great Plains, but that's simply not true. It was really created and only fit for traveling the great wagon road, which ran from Eastern Pennsylvania down through the Valley of Maryland and Virginia and into the Carolinas. And the Conestoga wagon is of course named after Conestoga, Pennsylvania, where these wagons were first crafted. Here you can see in this painting at left, the steep angles and distinctive shape of these uh, vehicles that appeared in, in, in Church's sketch and then later painting. So the Great Wagon Road was incredibly important for settlement into the south, but also west because of its connection with the Wilderness Road just south of where the Natural Bridge is. So the Natural Bridge is just here above Roanoke, and this is the Wilderness Road, which would take you into Daniel Boone country and due west. So why may this be an important detail? And why may be this figure um, be pointing towards that side, towards that? Um, well, I would argue or consider this a meditation on American history and again, um, and contemporary relevance. Um, Church is by this point, of course, not an abolitionist. Uh, it appears, it seems he did hold anti-slavery uh, feelings. We know that Congregationalist Church pastor that he was raised with was an anti-slavery advocate. Uh, and in New York City, he followed uh, a, a pastor in the Dutch Reformed Church, George Washington Bethune, to two different churches, going from one church to another. Bethune was an anti-slavery advocate and a member of the American Colonization Society. So he may have known of other instances in which the Natural Bridge was also allied with Thomas Jefferson uh, and slavery. Um, these two prints come from an English history of the United States states that take an abolitionist viewpoint. Here, two sites associated with Thomas Jefferson, the Natural Bridge and the capital of, of Virginia, uh, whose architect was Thomas Jefferson, are surrounded with these awful scenes of slave labor, slave punishment, uh, continued labor, the planter, uh, and a hope for deliverance. The main images themselves are just reproductions of William Goodacre's uh, original uh, prints from about a decade earlier. But the association with Jefferson in these sites is, uh, is there and pe people are starting to make these connections. A um, little out of order. So, so when Church visits in June of 1851, the conversation over slavery is uh, boiling over nine months after the Compromise of 1850, which just comes on the heels of the Mexican-American War, is talking about the history, the future of slavery uh, in the United States. Now that the Compromise of 1850 has allow allowed for the further expansion of slavery into the West and South, there's an immediate effect in Virginia, which Church may have noticed during his visit in, in, in uh, the middle of 1851, and that in Virginia, where slavery had a tenuous hold at best, is enlivened by the fact that there's now huge demands for its enslaved populations in other parts of this country. The export in Virginia was no longer the products of slave labor, but were the enslaved laborers themselves. Um, in these two scenes of the slave market here in Richmond, uh, where uh, the Richmond slave market was the number two slave market in the nation, uh, where it, it mainly sold enslaved people to the number one slave market in Richmond, uh, in New Orleans here uh, before the sale and after the sale by the English artist, Eric Crow. So when I look at this painting and I, and I think all about this and churches, again, not abolitionists, uh, very overt uh, 
opinions on slavery, but anxiety about it, anxiety about the future of the country. I wonder, can we read this, this black figure speaking to the woman um, uh, about what is West? Am I going West? Is slavery going West? It, is the future of the country bound to the expansion of slavery? And this is just building on its association. And of course, Church would um, later be much more uh, overt with his uh, uh, hatred of slavery and pro-union causes, including the famous Code of Paxi, I believe, again, with other scholars to be a reference to um, Frederick Douglass's church, uh, Frederick Douglass's uh, talk about volcanoes and the eruption in the United States during the Civil War. But I see these contemporary concerns, contemporary concerns about what the uncertain future may be intricately tied with the artist's understanding of American history, the complexities of Jefferson as the promoter of liberty and the enslaver, the expansionist and the one who allowed for the promulgation of slavery within his borders. And so with that, uh, with a kind of flurry at the end, because I do wanna make sure I leave time for any questions, I thank you very much for your time. And I wanna point out that um, as I point, that is only, that that's, only halfway through the exhibition do we get to Frederick Church, and I skipped out great stuff, in, including Edward Hicks and some other amazing work. So I really encourage anyone who has the opportunity to come visit us in Richmond. Thank you so much, Chris. And if you wouldn't mind unsharing your screen so we can get into oh, yes. the, the discussion with your, your face up front and center as we uh, dive deeper into all this really rich talk. Thank you so much. Uh, again, thank you all for being with us. Please do send questions in the Q&A mode at the bottom of the screen there. Um, we will um, give a little pause in about 10 minutes where people can log off if they need to, but maybe the conversation will continue beyond that um, if you're able to stay on the line here. So just some reflections from me. There's so many interesting threads to pick up there. Really a, a helpful talk for the, the work we're doing up here. You've drawn out some threads we've been thinking about lately. You noted how he's um, not only doing that fascinating uh, paint by numbers technique as you described it in, in the preparatory drawing, which I recall seeing in so many cold drawings, so maybe that's one of those things he learned from his teacher just across the river from us, um, but also noting the specific species of tree. This is much on our mind because of this um, current project with the artist uh, Gene Shin right now with Alana responding to the plight of Eastern hemlocks in our region. So the fact that he's noting these species attuned to botanical specificity in that place is significant and a through line for an artist who we think of often as a kind of artist scientist. So that was a useful thread. Um, one thing I found myself reflecting on um, from your uh, remarks Marks, uh, which were so helpful, something I hadn't thought of just in reading your, your really smart book that everybody should go out and buy, um, was the uh, similarities between um, this subject in a variety of ways, including its composition and uh, Cole's responses to Catterskill Falls. And I wonder if uh, you've thought at all about that. Of course, that's, um, I'm thinking of the the other picture that I believe is um, now missing from the Tuscaloosa Museum of Art where progress was and, and maybe the VMFA will bring that one home too and that would be great. But thinking about that vertical composition picture, um, there seems to me something of that in the vertical composition of, of Church's natural bridge picture. Um, and then also that interesting view over the top of it. That's that uh, church, uh, the, the Cole Catersco Falls picture that many of us know better. Um, I think it's now in the Wadsworth Athenaeum. Uh, um, where you look over the top and, and could that have been lurking in uh, churches subconscious for that reason? Do you see anything to that? Yeah, I think so. I, I mean, what it, it's been pointed out, uh, pointed out to me that the natural bridge is so unusual that it's really a vertical canvas as opposed to a horizontal. And I think, um, you know, you see him in those three drawings, the three Olana drawings, doing a vertical and two horizontals. Uh, and yet it, it, it's, it's the iconic, what I call keyhole image uh, of the bridge from the, from the base of the creek that he runs with. Um, but I, I think ties to the working method of Coles are so apt here. I mean, he's such a young artist still. I mean, I mean he's kind of vaulted to, to, to fame, but um, I, I think in, in terms of ingrained working methods, I, I would have to imagine they're still very much tied to his earlier training, which was not that long prior. 
that's interesting. We had a question from one commenter who, uh, knowing and loving this subject, was a little uh, disappointed, uh, Henry Neal, to learn that there, the Washington uh, initial story might be apocryphal. So could you say a little more about that? Um, yeah. Many visitors to the site take that as gospel and uh, would love to know what you've learned about that story. Yeah, it start now that um, I should say that the natural bridge has been was into in private hands all the way up until 2016 when it became a Virginia State Park. So the prolongation of that myth has, has happened a lot, um, but the park is being more a little more straightforward. Um, there's a few things to consider there. You know, Washington was doing a lot of surveying in Virginia, but for Lord Fairfax, way north of the natural bridge, um, he likely never. I mean, I don't think anyone believes he ever went down there for, for any other reason. He referred people, including uh, Louis King Louis Philippe, to visit when he was in exile, uh, to visit the Natural Bridge. But he, he likely had no reason to think of, is we know Washington and his, his rules of comportment that he writes as a very young man, uh, very obsessed with public image uh, and his role as a man in society, that really doesn't jive with me as something he would have done. And thirdly, when you visit the Natural Bridge, and I hope you do, it's just covered in inscriptions. I mean, full names, where people are from, what date they're there. Um, I, I wish I'd shown, I forget his name, it's J something, Philadelphia, 1853, you know. Um, and the GW one is across the creek, 25 feet up. It seems very odd. If he was there first, why would he describe it in such an odd position? Yeah, I think it's 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 most likely to me some other GW that um, was made into a, a hopeful myth, but yeah. Understood. So another um, useful thread in, in your remarks there is the, the history of state parks in America. So this one, a very new one, and, and we are proud of uh, Church's role in um, uh, advocating for the preservation of Niagara Falls as we understand the first state park in America as well. So there's a, a nice little through line there. Could you say a little more about that process? One of the things that's so um, fascinating about the history of Natural Bridge is that it, uh, as your, your book illuminates for us with these billboards and things that show uh, us Natural Bridge as a popular tourist attraction well into the 20th century, that is this kind of throwback and holdover of something that we in the Hudson Valley hear about long ago, how Catterskill Falls, to mention that subject again, was in private hands, that famous anecdote that if you wanted to see the waterfall, you had to pay to have the water turned on, that it was that civilized and that managed, and, and you have there this fascinating um, in living memory example of that. So it'd be useful to hear a little of that preservation story. Yeah, um, so it's, it's a very much an ongoing story. In fact, while it's administered as a state park, the land itself is held up in a trust, which has is in the process of transferring it to the state. So you'll go there today and see park rangers working there and, and presenting you the material. But the kind of building and the structures there are all from its 20th century automobile tourism, roadside attraction kind of history. Uh, is so many people who I've spoken with who've gone through the exhibition say I only knew it through 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 these kind of chotskis and souvenirs and things like that and memories of going there as a little child and seeing a light show that they do on the bridge or uh, Foamhenge, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a foam Stonehenge, uh, which was relocated. Um, but so it's interesting. So actually, one of the things we did in the exhibition is that I, I knew I wanted to stop the art in the show around 1900. But there's a whole other gallery that I worked with our education department to explore its 20th century imaging, how images are created and why and what kind of sticks. And we have this kind of immersive environment of 20th century souvenirs, photographs of famous and not famous people, uh, all the way going up to 21st century. And we have a bank of a large cabinet installed with uh, iPhones and iPads and whatever uh, that we've crowdsourced from our membership to show views of the natural bridge and how it's still being a source for image creation. Um, so yeah, very much the idea of the Natural Bridge as kind of roadside of attraction holds a much greater, greater sway right now, I would say, than the um, imagery and narrative we're trying to present in the exhibition. Um, I don't know if I need to overtake that idea, but at least present uh, you know, the, the ideas of what the Natural Bridge was in a kind of American culture writing art from the 1780s to about 1900. 
That's really interesting and really powerful. I think so often um, museums uh, and the perspective that folks like us bring to topics like this one tend to cut off subjects like this one from that equally fascinating, really rich, popular visual culture that they participate in both before and after people like Frederick Church grace it with their paintbrush. Um, so how interesting that you're bringing in uh, vernacular photography as they call it and, and uh, popular responses uh, to this subject that uh, again for, for historians is most associated with its 19th century visual culture. Um, so that's really rich. To go uh, away from the 20th century meaning of this subject and back toward the, the 18th, I'm, I'm curious about the the, um, the international meanings of natural bridge. And you did give us some of the, um, for British audience images, abolitionist images of natural bridge, Virginia simultaneously as place of wonder and great cruelty. Um, I'm curious about how all this fits into the particular battles that we understand Jefferson was involved in with uh, the naturalist Buffon and this, this anti-Americanism that was making all these natural historical arguments about the American continent that, that Jefferson engaged in very directly. Do you see um, his purchase of Natural Bridge as part of that larger external relations mission um, that he was so directly involved in? Or is it just a, a civic spirited, proud Virginian preserving it for the people of America? That's a, a great question. I mean, I think that there's so many threads to what Jefferson, I think, was intending with his holding on to the Natural Bridge for his whole life. Um, I think, like the man himself, it has many different sides. You know, um, again, I'll, I'll return to Eleanor Harvey's recent catalog and exhibition on Alexander von Humboldt, uh, who, where she approaches Frederick Church's um, painting of the Natural Bridge in this kind of idea of its of its role in, in the kind of scientific discourse, which, to be perfectly honest with you, I've, I've, I've largely avoided uh, in in my exhibition and catalog. Um, and I, so for me, it, I'm not sure because that's not the way I really thought about positioning it. For me, I'm, I, I've been thinking about positioning the Natural Bridge as a, um, a site that is specific to an American history in which Jefferson can promote Virginia and also himself. So, um, I mean, Jefferson also has very important ties to Harper's Ferry, you know, the Jefferson Rock at Harper's Ferry. I think that it, if the Harper's Ferry falls away from Jefferson's promotion of the Virginia, the Southern national icon in, in not opposition, but in kind of twinning to that earlier one. So I'm sorry, I don't have a great it's, answer. For it makes you. perfect sense. Yeah, it's, it's your project. There are just some uh, off the cuff observations about it. And you've given us uh, so much to think about it. You're, you have given us uh, all these other layers of the meaning of the place that the scientific doesn't have to be among them. But uh, it's a good sign of how rich this project is. Even if we can't be in the galleries immediately right now that you've um, gotten this thinking started. And I'm sure we'll be talking about this for some time to come. This will be uh, archived for the benefit of education staff at Olana and uh, out there on uh, YouTube for people to learn about. So. Uh, uh, it looks like there are no further questions. So thank you so much, Chris, for uh, sharing your time and knowledge and passion with us. Um, oh, it looks like somebody else just popped up a nice comment from Shannon Hackett. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so let's all try to get down to the exhibition uh, but before August 1st. It's really a special opportunity to see all these objects in one place. Um, I love those little vignettes of how you're recreating that Monticello installation and uh, interesting ideas that percolating there. So we'll hope to see it in person. Thank you all for being with us today. Thank you for being members of Olana. Please join if you're not already one um, and join us for another Olana webinar soon. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.